Transform, an excerpt from A Guide for Aging Heroes by Randolph Harrison with Erica Schwarting Harrison. Someone I loved once gave me a box full of darkness. It took me years to understand that this too was a gift. Mary Oliver. Developing a positive psychology lifestyle is a transformative process that reshapes the ordinary into the extraordinary. Erica and I are fascinated by the notions of transformation and rebirth. Rebirth is a metaphor that runs deep in the ancestral memories of human beings. In the Christian religion, Easter is celebrated in spring, signifying Christ's transformation from death to life. Spring itself is a symbol of rebirth. In winter, plants go dormant and appear dead. Many animals hibernate. When spring arrives, nature comes alive again. Taoism, Hinduism, and Buddhism capture rebirth with the concept of reincarnation. Humans have endless opportunities to get life right by being born into different forms. Pagan religions express the idea of renewal in their celebration of the winter solstice or Yule. The winter solstice is the shortest day of the year after which the days grow longer. The sun's return is observed by lighting candles and Yule logs and decorating homes with holly and evergreens. All are symbols of transformation from dark to light and from death to life. The ancient Greeks and Egyptians have stories about a mythical bird called the phoenix that symbolizes the sun and rebirth. The phoenix was a grand and beautiful creature with a lifespan of hundreds of years, but only one phoenix at a time was ever in existence. When it died, the phoenix would be consumed in flames. The new phoenix would then rise from its predecessor's ashes even greater than before. Each person who chooses a life of personal development is a phoenix. We are consumed by the flames of trauma, heartbreak, and hardship, and then we rise from the ashes stronger and wiser than before. I once spoke with a very old woman named Aileen who described this process in a way that moved me. She said, when I was young, I was anxious and fragile. A gentle breeze could blow me over. Then I lived through poverty, the Great Depression, two world wars, and the deaths of so many people I loved. Now I can stand tall in a hurricane, and it is almost time for me to leave. Aileen was a phoenix. Erica grew up as a minority to minorities. One of her birth parents was white, the other was black. As an infant, she was adopted by white parents from New York and raised by them in Western North Carolina. With an adopted family from New York, many things about Erica were very different from those in her community. Her dialect, social and political views, and diet were unlike those of her North Carolina circle. Erica was too black for white people and too white for black people. Southern Appalachia is a hard place to grow up if you are African American but it is an impossible place if you're a person of color who other people of color shun. Erica is a quiet person and she describes feeling invisible in school. To a large degree, she lived a life of solitude. The fires of isolation and rejection incinerated Erica, but she emerged as one of the strongest, most caring people I have ever known. She is deeply involved in charity work and is always willing to pitch in when people need help. In her everyday life, she gives and gives and gives. She is skilled at deflecting the daily slights that people from all minority groups have to manage. Her challenges have given her an inner strength that floors me. I am a reasonably attractive, reasonably intelligent, white, middle-class male raised in the southeastern United States. When it comes to being born into privilege, I pretty much hit the jackpot for everything but wealth. Considering these circumstances, I might easily have become a selfish, hard-hearted jerk. Finding people with my background who turned out that way is not difficult. However, I also have a mood disorder called major depression. 
I have endured depressive episodes that I would not wish on my worst enemy. Ultimately though, I am grateful for the gifts that depression has provided. Depression has given me not only depths of emotion that are inaccessible to people without the condition, but also insight into the suffering of others. Depression has endowed me with empathy. Empathy is not sympathy. For kind people, compassion is easy. Feeling sorry for folks who are suffering comes naturally to caring people. Empathy requires effort. Empathy demands mentally putting yourself in another person's place and trying to understand the world from their point of view. Practicing empathy for people you don't like can be very uncomfortable. You must put your ego on the back burner to pull it off. Charles M. Blow said, one does not have to operate with great malice to do great harm. The absence of empathy and understanding is enough. Well-developed empathy skills are uncommon. Cultivating genuine empathy should be on everyone's to-do list. As a child, I was a low achiever with terrible self-esteem. I was small, insecure, and constantly bullied. I was the last one picked for any team sport and was regularly ridiculed and humiliated. In the schoolyard pecking order, I was at the very bottom. Like many victims of bullies, I had a rich fantasy life where I was strong and brave. In my dreams, the bullies all met with a reckoning and I was the hero. The themes of my imaginary play always centered on a downtrodden underdog who would overcome insurmountable odds or die trying. I loved imagining the old athlete past his prime continuing to compete valiantly against younger and stronger opponents. Whenever I went to the beach, I would build sandcastles with multiple moats and walls to protect them from the incoming tide. As the waves came in, I would struggle in vain to reinforce the walls, knowing that ultimately the sea would always win. In retrospect, the process was an excellent metaphor for life. Every life ends in the same tragedy with no way to escape the fate of dying. What matters is how you work to meet life's challenges until that tide washes you away. In childhood, I was courageous in my fantasies and timid in life. Except for a handful of cousins who were my best friends growing up, I avoided other kids. I was terrified of public attention and stayed away from crowds at all costs. It took me years to come to terms with the torment I went through as a kid. Education, self-reflection, and more than a few fistfights eventually helped me come out on the other side. I was swallowed by the fires of depression and childhood bullying, but from those ashes emerge an empathetic advocate for disadvantaged people. I give a pass to the child bullies who tortured me. In their families, they were probably victims themselves. Conversely, I hold adult bullies accountable. Erica and I actively campaign against injustice in all its miserable forms. Bigotry, racism, homophobia, and anti-Semitism are just alternative names for bullying. We live in an age that glorifies bullies. Financially successful bullies are admired as role models. Concern for the welfare of less fortunate people is derided as a sign of weakness and naivete. Bullies have even affected our language. One expression, political correctness, has enhanced the smug disregard bullies feel for marginalized people. The term politically correct has replaced what we used to call good manners. I think the intellectual, emotional, and physical development Erica and I enjoy now can be traced to experiences of feeling helpless and alone as children. I wonder what kind of lackluster lives we might have accepted if we hadn't gone through that suffering. Could we have become weak-minded bullies ourselves? There are undoubtedly sad people who are beaten down by life and never recover. Why are traumatic experiences transformative for some people and not for others? Aside from legitimate mental health issues, I think the difference is one's understanding of freedom and responsibility. We are each thrown into life under circumstances over which we have no control. Some of us land in wealth and opportunity, others in poverty and persecution. That part of life is a crapshoot and nothing about it is fair. What we choose to do with those circumstances is where responsibility 
becomes the determining factor. A child whose life is miserable because she is growing up in difficult circumstances is pretty powerless to change her situation. An adult who's miserable because she grew up in difficult circumstances as a kid has not only the freedom but also the responsibility to change it. This is not to say that everyone has the life skills to overcome such a challenge. Sometimes seeking and accepting help from others is a necessary part of the process. Ultimately, power and responsibility for initiating change lie with the individual. People who take responsibility for their lives in the present, regardless of the cards they have been dealt, are phoenixes.